Communion is all about covenant. The Bible's all about covenant. He's a covenant-keeping God. First of all, we know that in every book of the Bible, Jesus is talked about. But right from the beginning, it shows God is covenant-keeping, and we have to know and understand what covenant is in order to really appreciate and know and understand what Jesus really did for us and what was accomplished because of it. So to begin with, let's look at Matthew 26, 21 to 28. Paul wasn't here at this time. He wasn't a disciple, so he didn't get this instruction. He got it later, which we will read later. But this is Jesus. He wanted to eat the Passover meal with them. But now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Next verse. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? Because they had no idea whether or not they were even going to betray him. Next verse. And he answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Now they were partaking of a covenant meal. The person that betrayed Jesus was there taking and sharing a communion, a covenant meal with him. He was going to break the covenant. Now since Jesus has come, the covenant's between God and Jesus, but back then it was between Abraham and his seed, it was with people. What you do, you, you walk in that, and as you do works, you get blessings, etc. But here was Judas, we know it was Judas. He is absolutely celebrating fellowship, communion with Jesus, only to betray him and break covenant. We sometimes think it's just a matter of breaking, I mean, of betrayal. But when there's betrayal, you're breaking the covenant. And, in, in, and it isn't that way with us today because of the grace of God. But generally, when somebody makes a covenant with somebody, they then die. The penalty for breaking covenant is death. And you see, because the blessing and the curses are pronounced at time of cutting a covenant, that person has as much faith in the blessing as in the curse. Unfortunately, I believe the body of Christ has had the curse taught more and how unworthy we are and how we have to work to get God to love us and work for this and work for that, that we end up with more faith in the repercussion of the curse than the blessing. And yet Jesus bore the curse for us. The curse isn't for us. Yes, we miss it. But that's not why we do what we do. Holiness is something that's very important. We're to walk in holiness. But we have gone to the extreme of religion thinking I have got to walk in holiness. I have to do all these things to please God. That's not covenant thinking. That's not grace through faith. I've been born again, saved thinking. That's works thinking. And I want to tell you again today, there's nothing you can ever do to make God love you more or you can ever do to get God to love you less. He loved you so much, he sent his son, Jesus. So that's never going to change. Holiness doesn't come about because of what you do. It becomes about because of what Jesus did for you. And when we realize the price Jesus paid for us and the love he has for us, holiness becomes an automatic walk of life. Because you won't go anywhere that your mind hasn't gone there already. But as we renew our mind to the word of God, we won't go in that direction of sin, unholiness. It's only when we think about it. As someone said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you there longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. 
but we're not trying to be holy. Holiness has been built into us by the Spirit of God. And this is important because then holiness is just an automatic walk when you are in relationship and fellowship with your Heavenly Father. The next verse on that, please. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. You see, it's talking about breaking covenant. That's why. Jesus didn't pronounce a curse on that man. The curse was out there when it was given. The curse was given just before Deuteronomy 28. And all the Israelites said, we do, amen, we accept that, the blessing, and we accept if we break the blessing, break covenant, we'll have the curse. And the sins of the fathers would go down on and on. So this man broke covenant, and he knew what the cost of curse was. Next verse. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? I mean, he already took money to do it. Is it I? He said to him, you have said it. Next verse. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples. And Judas was with him at this time, said, take, eat, this is my body. This is really, really huge. Jesus didn't break covenant. Judas still hadn't betrayed Jesus. He hadn't gone in the garden, kissed him, led the people there. He had, but Jesus didn't break covenant. He's having a covenant meal with Judas. This was before he went to the cross. This was before he paid the price for man to be born again. I want you to see how powerfully strong covenant is. That even though Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed, he still shared covenant meal with him. He still was telling him, he was saying, take, eat, this is my body. I'm going to give my body for you. If it's that strong in the old covenant, how much more, how much stronger is our covenant today? And we think Jesus is going to get mad at us or God's going to curse us or something because we miss it, because we don't do something quite right. You see, we're looking at it from the human perspective, like, all right, get out of my face already. I am not sharing a meal with you. Out of my house. But this is love. Love never speaks evil of anyone. Love never is harsh or cruel. Take eat, this is my body. Next verse. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. All of you. That included Judas. Share communion. Now we see we share together because we're one body. Next verse. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The blood of the new covenant. The old covenant had the blood of bulls and goats, but this is my blood. Sinless blood. It's shed for many. Now we can see here that Jesus said, this is my blood, this is my body, this is my blood. It was actual physical elements. It did not turn into his body and blood. He still had his body and he still had his blood. Next verse. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I'm going to throw something out at you. I'm not trying to start a new doctrine. If you don't want to accept it, you don't need to accept it. But we're now, the Father's kingdom has come. 
and he is drinking it with us today. He said, the kingdom is within you. And I know we've often looked at it as we won't drink it. He's not going to drink it again until the rapture. The kingdom is come. It says when two or three of you are gathered, there am I in the midst of you. He is here today sharing communion with us. Hallelujah. He's here with us today sharing communion. You know, you might say, well, I don't see him. You don't have to, but he walked through the churches, walked through the church of Ephesus. He's here sharing communion with us today. Let's look at Luke 22, 19 to, Luke 22, 19 to 22. I'm looking, and we're looking at where Jesus first introduced communion. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Remembrance of what? Of everything he taught them. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember the goodness of my Father. Remember covenant. This was a covenant meal. When we have communion, we're to remember covenant. Next verse. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup in the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. You do not have covenant without blood. There's always blood. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. A second reference showing that Judas was there and Jesus was sharing communion with him. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet, as a symbol of servanthood, how Jesus is now still serving us as intercessor and mediator, our advocate, he washed Judas' feet, even though he knew he would be betrayed. And truly the Son of Man goes that it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. What is Jesus saying? Covenant. That man is going to break covenant. And Judas had as much faith in that covenant as anything of, of the curse of that covenant. He knew it. So when he gave the money back and he couldn't undo what he did, the only thing for him to do would be repent as Peter did when he denied him. But you see, his heart was wrong. He didn't repent. Instead, what he did was go out and hang himself. Breaking of the covenant is death. Genesis 15, 1, please. We're looking at where this covenant, and we talk about the blessings of Abraham are ours. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. How Jesus became a curse because he was hung on a tree so that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith. But after these things, after Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and after Abraham raised his hand and gave his tithes and said, no one but God, he understood covenant. And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. Covenant talk. Covenant talk. God would be Abraham's protector and provider from that time on. And even when he let somebody take his wife, his wife was protected. His flocks and herds were protected. His children's children were protected. Why? Because of covenant. Abraham had nothing but liabilities. And God had nothing but assets. But you've got to understand, in a covenant, everything you own belongs to your covenant partner. And everything your covenant partner has is now yours. Well, all my liabilities go to God, and he has all my assets. I, have liabil I had liabilities. 
And if there's a liability in my life today, Jesus has already covered it. And God gave me all his liabilities and gave me all his assets. The great thing is, God doesn't have any liabilities. In Genesis 22, 22, please. Genesis 22, 22. Oh, I think not. Well, I have Genesis 22, 22, but that might be the wrong scripture, you know, when you're typing fast. And is that what it, then the rib of, which, 2, 22, Genesis 22, 22. I will look it up. We will be right back. Actually, we're not going anywhere, but... Uh, I apologize for this little burp. 22.22. No, that's not the one I want. I want it where, um, where Abraham was asked to um, sacrifice Isaac. And we will hopefully find it. If somebody has it, just shout it out. Well, I'll just tell you what it says. Abraham finally got his son, the promised son, him and Sarah. And after Isaac was, I don't know, late teens, God said to um, Abraham, I want you to go up to Mount Moriah and I want you to sacrifice Isaac. I want your firstborn. 22.2. I want your firstborn. So we'll look at 22.2. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, abide here with the donkey and I will, and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Verse eight, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. In the movie, I haven't seen it, but it's the movie where Abraham's asked to do this. It portrays him in great distress, crying, anger, whatever. Abraham understood covenant. And if my covenant partner, who told me Isaac would be my heir, through whom the promised seed would come, and he was talking about Jesus. And he said, if he told me that, I know his word is good. He can have my son. Because it says in Hebrews, he received him up. He received him up from the ashes. He knew he could depend on his covenant partner. Zero fear. Abraham had something, his covenant partner, God, Yahweh needed, and that was his son. He did not hold back his son, his only son. Sometimes God might ask us for something. We have to realize it's not just saying no to God. You're saying no to covenant. You're saying no to the blood covenant that Jesus shed his blood for. If God asks you for something, he's got a very good reason for it. And here's a perfect example. He asked for his son Isaac. He went up there. But you can see the faith of Abraham because he said, we will return. He knew God would raise him up. He already saw it in a figure. Get your imagination in line with the word of God. The reason God asked him for his son was you do not ever ask your covenant partner for something that you're not willing to give. 
and the covenant partner, us human beings, never knew to ask for Jesus. So now with Abraham offering up Isaac, that gave God the right to bring his son into the earth and offer him up as a sacrifice for his covenant partner. God just doesn't do whatever he wants to do. He already set it in motion. Isaac was offered. And of course, God said, stay your hand. But Isaac was offered. And Abraham's faith was there that he would raise him up, which is where the faith was. He said, God will provide himself a lamb. He saw a ram. A ram is not a lamb. He spoke faith in the future that that lamb God would provide for himself, his name was Jesus. And that he would be killed, sacrificed, but that God would raise him up. Hallelujah. That's all because of covenant. And I'm telling you this this morning because I want you to know how strong the covenant is. Everything God has is yours through Jesus when you make him your Lord and Savior. That's what we're celebrating when we celebrate communion. That's, the disciples knew that. They understood covenant. They understood what Jesus was saying. When Jews have come to know the Lord and they take communion, they always thought the middle bread was Isaac, it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they could never understand why Jacob was always broken. Isaac, pardon me, was broken. When they come to the Lord, they realize it's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus had to be broken for you and me. So the innocent shed his blood for the guilty. As a result, we now have God's life. It's a better covenant. In Hebrews 8, 6 to 7, we have a better covenant based on better promises. Now he has an obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. He is the mediator. He is the mediator. Nobody can get past Jesus. He mediates that covenant on my behalf. When I say in the name of Jesus, by his stripes I'm healed, he mediates that on my behalf. That power that's in me then flows. He mediates it. He doesn't look and open a book and say, no, Arlene missed it here, 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 and here. You see, he already paid the price for my missing it. There is no curse in the new covenant. If you sin... If you go sideways, if you get involved in adultery, say adultery. And you, so you're married, you have children, you get involved in adultery. That is a sin that'll keep you longer than you want to be there, cost you more than you want to pay. It could ruin your family. It doesn't ruin your relationship with God. You are still his child. But there are consequences in the natural realm. If that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Let's quit trying to put us under the old covenant. We're not under the old covenant. We have a new covenant based on better promises. What's that better promise? We're new creatures in Christ. We've been born again. There's no curse. Jesus dealt with the curse. So there's no curse spoken over us. It's gone. We have to have more faith in the covenant blessing than we have in a curse that no longer is applicable to us. The good news about covenants is that believers have a covenant with God, nobody else. But that covenant isn't between me and God because then it could be broken. That covenant is between God and Jesus Christ, the man Jesus, and neither of them will ever break it. What do you have as a result of that covenant? The new birth. 
And you can go through all the names of God. Exodus, the Lord, your healer, your physician. Your covenant declares the blessing of health and healing and wholeness to you. Your covenant declares protection for you. It declares deliverance. It declares prosperity, peace. All for you because of Jesus. You don't have to work for him. You don't have to be good enough for him. You have to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You then become born again by grace through faith. And that not of yourself, the grace and the faith is yours, given to you by God. He gives you faith to be able to believe what Jesus accomplished for you today. This is what we're remembering. We have entered into that covenant through Jesus. It's a better covenant. Jesus shed his blood, sinless blood, for you and me today. Jesus took his blood and went into the heavenly holy of holies with it. And Jesus' blood is on the heavenly mercy seat. His blood has, has perfect life in it because it says that the blood of Abel cries out vengeance, but the blood of Jesus cries out mercy. And his blood is on the mercy seat. And he tells me in his name, come boldly to the throne of grace, that I might find mercy in time of need. When I go there, his blood is on the mercy seat, and he lives and he mediates for me, and I go there in his name, and I have mercy. Anytime I've missed it, I go there and I have mercy. I do not get the curse. I do not get slapped. I do not get negated. He gives me mercy. You see, because when I go there, there is repentance involved. I go there because I'm forgiven and I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I can go there. That's my home. Jesus is there. His blood is there. And it cries mercy. Anytime you approach the throne of grace, anytime you repent, anytime you cry out, Jesus, there's mercy for you today. Don't work for it. Just believe it. Why? Covenant. It's because of covenant. I want us to look at Ephesians 2.12. Why it's so important for us to know covenant. In that, at that that at that time you were without Christ. This is before we got born. We were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Meaning we didn't, we didn't belong to Israel who had the covenant. And strangers from the covenants of promise. We had no hope. And we were without God. That's where we were. But Jesus... Now, we're no longer strangers, and we do have a covenant. No longer strangers. You see, when God found us, we were so deep in debt, we owed everything. You might say, well, I wasn't in debt. I had lots of money. I had three mansions, five yachts. No, no, no. You were spiritually so far in debt, there was no way you could dig yourself out. You were down. We were in debt. Trespasses and sins brought us there. We couldn't pay our way out because it took the precious blood of Jesus to get us out of that. You see, it seems ridiculous. And only God's love could do it. But God took all my debt, all my Sickness, disease, everything, and put it on Jesus. You see, you know, in the Old Testament, they put their hand on the scapegoat, led him away into the wilderness. Jesus, God took all of this and put it on Jesus. I don't have a debt to pay. I don't owe God anything as far as sins and all the rest of it. 
God's not saying, Arlene, you owe me this and this and this and this because of what I've done. No, Arlene wants to do this, this, and this because out of honor and thankfulness for what he's done. Not to gain favors with him. I already have his favor. His unmerited favor is already mine. Hallelujah. He put all of that on Jesus. He got all of my debts. And I got all of his debts. Which were zero. I don't mind taking somebody's debts when the, they equal zero. And I gained assets. A new spirit. The righteousness of God. But like a covenant always has some kind of symbol or something, a gift exchanged, and we got a lot of gift. But one of the things I want us to know today, among many, but anyway, we have talked about Livingston and Stanley, and we've talked about that covenant cut. I, don't, I think it was Stanley, but whichever one it was with that warring tribe, and all he gave them was this spear. And around the top, it was wound with copper, and wherever he went, people would bow down to him because it was the king's spear. Jesus has been given a name above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Now you go in my name. You go in my authority. And every sickness, every disease poverty every demon in hell must bow its knee to you because he's the king of kings but you're a king he's the high priest but you're a royal priesthood they must bow to you in jesus name because you have a covenant with almighty god hallelujah hallelujah it's time for you to dance at home just have a glory fit Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus said, greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. Well, let's read it this way, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Greater love hath no man than he lay down his blood for his friends. Hallelujah. You see, the way you see God changes everything he is not a monster people think god did a whole lot of mean things to the israelites leading them here when they didn't do things but they said amen and agreed to the curse that was just coming to pass because they had faith in it well jesus took that curse for you and me and we say amen to the blessing hallelujah Glory to God.